Well, good afternoon. I'm Steve Kaplan, and I am the Neubauer Family Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance. And uh, today we're going to talk about entrepreneurs who matter, uh, identifying and building high growth ventures. And uh, we've got three terrific panelists who I am going to introduce in a second. But first, I'll, I'll just set the stage a little bit. Um, there are roughly 600,000 businesses started each year that are not like sole proprietorships. So these are businesses where there's an employee. And of those 600,000, something like 1,000 get venture funding. So that's one sixth of 1%. And the company, most of the companies that are started are lifestyle businesses or very small businesses. The companies that get venture funding are at the other end of the spectrum, and they're the businesses that are solving problems and creating jobs. And so today's panel, you're going to see three high growth ventures, all receive venture funding, and are all creating jobs and growth. And it's interesting, they're in three very different areas. One's in uh, the industry of vehicle sharing. Uh, another is in online payment processing. And the third is in analytics and decision sciences. And all three companies, Braintree, Mu Sigma, and Zipcar, uh, have been listed among Inc. Magazine's uh, list of fastest growing companies for the past several years. And uh, all three companies are on the list uh, this year. So. It's a great panel with very interesting companies. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. And then I'm going to ask them to talk for three to five minutes about their businesses and the path they took to get there. Uh, and then I have a few other questions. And then eventually, uh, I will open it up to questions from all of you. So uh, start thinking about questions you might ask. and. Uh, be ready to ask them. So here we go. First, in the middle there is Scott Griffith. And uh, Scott is the CEO of Zipcar. He's been the CEO since February of 2003. Uh, Zipcar is the world's leading car sharing network with over 650,000 customers. At least that's what I wrote down. I assume it's higher today. Uh, Zipcar was funded by Benchmark, one of the leading venture firms in the world. Uh, and uh, a little over a year ago, April, uh, Scott took Zipcar through an IPO. Uh, he's received a number of awards and recognitions for his role at Zipcar. And uh, before Zipcar, he was at Boeing, at Information America, at the Parthenon Group. And before that, I'm very happy to say, uh, Scott received his MBA at Booth, where I was privileged to have him as a student. So uh, welcome to Scott. Thank you. Thanks. It's actually one of the best things, or not the best things, probably the only good thing about getting older is your students start doing really well, and uh, you get to uh, enjoy that. So uh, second uh, to my direct right, your left, is Brian Johnson. And Brian is the founder and chairman of Braintree, which is a payment provider for many of the world's top online businesses. Uh, he started Braintree in 2007 while he was an MBA student. Uh, and that year, Braintree won the New Venture Challenge. And I'll talk more about the New Venture Challenge later. Um, unfortunately for me, he was not in my section. He was in Ellen Rudnick's section. And uh, I'm very jealous. Um, but Brian profitably bootstrapped Braintree for four years. And uh, last year, he accepted a $34 million investment from Axel Partners, again, one of the leading venture capital firms in the world. And uh, Braintree's on track to process over $4 billion in credit card transactions this year. And Brian was named to Crane's Chicago Business Tech 25 and 40 Under 40. And uh, we will hear more from Brian, but please welcome him. And uh, third, uh, to your far left, is Daraj Rajaram. And Daraj is the founder and CEO of Mu Sigma. 
And Mu Sigma today is the world's largest pure play analytics services company. Uh, Mu Sigma partners with clients to help solve high impact business problems in sales, marketing, supply chain, and risk. Uh, right now, uh, or at least last I checked, Mu Sigma had 75 Fortune 500 clients including Microsoft, Walgreens, Home Depot, and Pfizer. And again, in the last year, uh, Diraj and Mu Sigma raised $108 million from Sequoia and General Atlantic, two of the leading venture capital firms in the world. So you now have these three companies that basically raised money from, I would say, four of the top five or seven VC firms in the world. Before Mu Sigma, Raj uh, worked as a strategy consultant at Booz Allen uh, in PricewaterhouseCoopers. And before that, he received his MBA from Chicago Booth, where I was privileged to have him as a student. <laughs> so uh, welcome to Diraj. <laughs> so uh, now I'll be quiet, and uh, let's hear from uh, the three of them about uh, the path that took them to uh, get to their current venture and uh, what it does. And uh, why don't we, we'll work our way over. We'll start with Diraj and uh, work our way over. Sure. So uh, it's, it's uh, nice to be back here. Uh, that used to be my seat uh, right back there. Um, uh, you know, uh, on, sorry? <laughs> Uh, on good days, uh, on, on, on bad days, that so that I can just get out of there quickly. <laughs> so, uh, um, Mu Sigma is, uh, like Steve said, an analytics services and decision sciences company. You know, I think of myself as an entrepreneur by chance. I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, when I was uh, at GSB, uh, you know, I, I, I took Steve's class, uh, more thinking that I would, I would want to get to know the VC industry, less uh, to become an entrepreneur. Um, so, um, uh, you know, um, in 2003, 2004 time frame, we basically, uh, you know, one of the things that I saw was that data was doubling every 18 months. Cost of memory was becoming cheaper and cheaper. Computing power was increasing on a continuous basis. Uh, and one of the things that we saw was that if businesses had to innovate on a continuous basis, and uh, they have to have a culture of experimentation in them. And if that had to happen, they needed to bring down the cost of innovation and cost of experimentation considerably. Uh, which meant that business world, uh, if you're making changes, you are looking to measure how well you're doing with respect to those changes, and decision sciences and analytics came part and parcel with that. So which means one had to institutionalize decision sciences and analytics. Uh, with that as a thought, uh, I took this idea to Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, you know, I was, I was this 28-year-old kid. Uh, and uh, my partners there told me, you know, why don't you grow up a little bit more and then we'll listen to you. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so with no uh, business plan, uh, you know, uh, Steve would, uh, you know, uh, would be very angry with me for this. Uh, but <laughs> uh, just started the company and um, uh, with the thought process that, you know, uh, we have to uh, take this occult science of analytics and decision sciences and demystify and democratize it. Um, you know, for the first eight, nine months, we had no customers, was a single employee. And then, um, you know, Microsoft uh, agreed to be a customer very graciously. And we never looked back from there onwards. Um, in the last uh, three years, we've grown about 850% overall. We've been on Inc. magazines, like Steve said, fastest growing company every year. Uh, we've been funded by the guys who put money into Google and the guys who put money into Facebook. Um, last year, we got recognized by Walmart as the supplier of the year. And um, the one thing that we do is pretty much take an interdisciplinary approach 
by using a combination of math, understanding of business, and use of technology to help create dedicated centers of analytical expertise for our clients. And we understood that you know, this had to be done on a large scale basis. And for that to happen, you have to be able to uh, use a global operation. So we had operations in India and here, and pretty much uh, brought down the cost of doing this thing quite a bit and enabled people to do it a lot more. Um, McKinsey basically came up with a report which said that uh, by 2018, the world is going to be shot by about 200,000 data scientists. Um, if you go to any eighth grade in the world today, even in India or in US, you're not going to see many people who say that they want to do, if you go to an eighth grade and ask them how many of you want to be applied mathematicians, you're not going to see many hands go up. Uh, Chicago, um, you know, fortunately for us, is a school which uh, is a big, big supporter of, you know, the quantitative way of thinking about business. So I'm very, very proud of that fact. And the fact that you know a company like this could be created, most of my initial g employees were actually uh, Chicago JSB students. I have one here, Mukund Raghunath, who was actually emotionally blackmailed to join Mu Sigma. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, <laughs> but 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 that's how we started this company. And uh, we have, uh, this year we'll probably do uh, more than hundred million dollars in revenue. Um, and uh, hopefully we want to continue in in that growth path um, and we think we have we have an opportunity to build something really really huge uh, we had opportunities to get bought out and all of those things but we continue wow. to stay stay true to what we believe uh, and uh, it's, it's an exciting run so far great Scott just keep going keep going all right <clears throat> well, I, I will say, uh, I was uh, class of 1990, and I think, um, Steve, if you had put this sort of panel together in 90, I'm not sure there would have been people in the aisles and people along the back. So I think you and the team have brought the school a really long way when it comes to thinking about entrepreneurship and its importance to both education and the community the, around the school and the city here. Um, and I applaud all the work that you and the rest of the folks at Polsky are doing. Nice well, job. You. Nice job. Well, thank you. We also wouldn't have had three people like you, so uh, <coughs> well, it's we, very mutual. So. <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, I, I think t two things, maybe just a quick description of where Zipcar is today, and I'd like to tell the story of how I came into the company because I'm not the founder, um, and I think that's instructive for, for people that might be thinking about either founding their own company or joining an entrepreneurial company and how you find where you want, might want to fit in. I think that's one of the more interesting parts of, of my path over the last nine years. So I joined in very early 2003 um, after a very short due diligence process, which I'm convinced to this day benefited the company more than it did me. Um, I would have asked for more if I had just known more. Um, but the, uh, the end point we are today is we're, we're by far the world's largest car sharing company. Uh, we're public, we're about a $300 million run rate. Um, this year, um, we've said, will be our first year for full gap profitability. We've been in investment mode, growing into new cities and new markets uh, this year, um, including uh, an acquisition recently, and then more cities in Europe, uh, which is why I look so tired most of the time. Um, but it's been an extraordinary ride to get to 18 major cities and now about 270 universities um, that have our cars on and near campus. Uh, we have about 10,000 cars in total. We have well over 700,000 members now. Um, we, did, we have been growing, Steve, since we wrote that document, apparently. <laughs> but um, So it's just an extraordinarily exciting time for our company. We're well capitalized. We went public last year. We have $100 million on our balance sheet, and we're cash flow positive. Uh, we announced yesterday another big asset-backed securities deal so that we're not using equity anymore to get cars. We're now um, levering that with, um, with, with uh, sub-5% funding to, to buy the asset base. So we've really become uh, almost a global company with operations in the UK and Spain now, uh, funded by debt and equity in the public capital markets. Um, and the thing that is, to me, most exciting about the story that we get to tell now is, is we're actually giving something back to the community just by getting bigger. Um, people are choosing not to buy cars or they're choosing to sell cars uh, because of our service every day. About half of our members tell us that they don't, they don't buy a car or they're, they're selling their car as a result 
of our service. Now, that hasn't necessarily made us the most popular um, in Detroit, or uh, even though I, I, I know Bill Reinard, who was our luncheon speaker, quite well. Um, I think the auto industry has now converted and, and embraced the idea that whether it's Zipcar or other business models or other services and other brands that come along, the idea of single, uh, single owner vehicles, especially in cities, and especially if you start to think about the millennials, the under age 35 crowd, that selling into cities and selling into millennials through the old model of let's sell everybody at least one car and then two as they, as they get a two car garage. Um, is, is probably a declining trend, at least in cities and at least along, uh, among millennials. So Zipcar uh, really has a lot of wind in the sails right now, and we're getting support directly from the auto industry, uh, major partnerships now with Ford Motor Company. Um, so that's the world we are today. Um, uh, but the company I joined was, was losing um, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and um, was about a $2 million run rate business. So we've grown well over 7,000% if you just do the math, kind of an order of magnitude. Um, of growth in the company. Um, and I think the, the most exciting part of that whole journey has been uh, what has happened to me personally. Um, and I, I've learned, and I actually have a blog now called Innovate Yourself, that the most important innovation has not been Zipcar or the technology uh, or some of the things we've done. It's been the occasional opportunities and almost necessity to, op to innovate myself, my leadership style, how I communicate, how I use my time, uh, what I focus my efforts on, who I surround myself with on the board or at the company. Um, major lessons learned and probably one of the most exciting parts of being an entrepreneur is that you're always kind of trying to figure out what's happening out over the horizon somewhere and you have a vision, but um, at times you have to sort of step back and innovate yourself. And for me, that's been um, such a wonderful revelation. And it really goes back to how I got into the company, which I said I'd finish that story. Um, so I grew up in Pittsburgh and watched what happened to that city in the 70s and early 80s as the steel industry sort of disintegrated. And if you do the analysis, it was, it was a shift in labor costs offshore, but it was technology that really, really shifted that, that whole sector away from Pittsburgh and western Pennsylvania and Ohio. And I became just very excited and intrigued by business models and technology and how they can impact industries as big as the steel industry. Um, and so I sort of followed that idea for most of my life. I joined the Boeing company, which is a big company, uh, and then went on to Hughes Aircraft, but have always worked in elements of those companies that were game-changing business models or game-changing technologies. And um, after uh, going through about 14 years ago a, a major life impact uh, cancer treatment um, for about nine months in chemotherapy and radiation, I kind of stepped back and I was at the Parthenon Group at the time doing business strategy consulting. Uh, and went, in, went back into the real world and eventually, a couple years later, sort of stumbled into to Zipcar and, and, and was really looking for a place where I could have an impact um, that would build a company but also have an impact on uh, cities or society or something that I was very interested in. So it was almost the perfect intersection of an opportunity to use technology, game-changing business models and innovation uh, and then also have this impact on cities and urban life that Zipcar's having now. Um, and so I took this major leap of faith to come in and replace the founder um, in what was nearly a bankrupt company at the time. Uh, and, you know, I called some of my business school classmates and friends that I kept in close touch with and told them what I was about to do, and they all thought I was nuts. That, you know, but, you know, my, my thought was this thing could be as big as the auto industry itself if we can figure out how to make money and execute against it. Uh, so that's the beginning of the story and, the, and a little bit of where we are today um, and a really exciting path um, that, that all really started in Steve Kaplan's class, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I won't take any credit. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> yeah, I would echo what Scott said and express appreciation for uh, Steve and the effort that he and uh, Ellen Rudnick, Linda Dara, Bob Rosenberg and Waverly Deutsch have done with the entrepreneurship. Uh, they've really done a great job here in Chicago, and they've lit a spark, I think, that's really helped a lot of other people build on top of it. Um, I love entrepreneurship. I think it's one of the most beautiful things that human beings can do, and primarily because you can create. Uh, just like an author sits down to blank pages, and they can create the world they live in, entrepreneurship gives you that same ability. You create the products and services you build, the culture you live in, the people you hire, you create your world. And to me, that it's a beautiful thing. 
Um, when I was younger, I never understood why I would trade my time for a fixed amount of money, why I would agree that $10 an hour was a sufficient wage to compensate me for my time, or that $20,000 a year or $30,000 a year. I wanted to determine what I was worth, and if it was zero, that's okay. If it was a million, that's okay as well. But I wanted to determine what I was worth. And so I always sought out opportunities where I could determine that value and also create the world I lived in. And how I got started with Braintree was really accidental. Um, I was in the middle of a venture that we had been doing for two years, and I was, um, we were basically, we didn't make any money for the time, and I was broke. I couldn't pay my mortgage. I had a, a, a wife and a child at the time. And so I emailed the wealthiest people in Utah that I could find, and I said, hey, I'm young, I'm smart, I'm capable, I can come work for you, and I can just do whatever you want me to do. I just need some money. And um, no one responded back, unsurprisingly. I then went to the job boards. I applied to dozens and dozens of jobs, and I needed to maintain flexibility because I needed to work on my other venture. And of course, no one would even consider me as an employee. And so with no options, I took the only job I could find, which was credit card processing, marching up and down the street, selling this stuff door to door. And it was brutal. Uh, I mean, you walk in the door, and the moment they hear that you're selling something, they're hostile. But then when they hear you're selling credit card processing, from which they've been duped for years and years, it's outright hostility. And um, it, was, it was discouraging, but I needed to make ends meet. And so I put together this pitch book, and I thought, okay, these guys have been taken advantage of for years, so I'm going to be entirely transparent. I'll be honest, upfront, and transparent. And I put this, this book together, and I would say, if you give me five minutes of your time, I promise you I'll earn your business. And that was you know, intriguing enough that these people would accept it, and I would sit down and I'd walk them through the industry, who the players were, what they did, why they did what they did, what I did. And I just broke down all the barriers and was honest. And I won 65, 75% of, of the business I presented. I became the, the company's number one salesperson. I broke all their sales records doing this part-time. And um, I had 400 reps nation, uh, nationwide. And I found this really great industry of credit card processing. And uh, with that, I started Braintree. And um, there were a couple of big shifts going on within the industry when I joined. Um, uh, I started Braintree four years ago. Um, one is... Uh, the analogy I would draw is 10 years ago, if you would have bought a cell phone, you would have based that decision on the minutes in the plan, whether it was regional or national, and text messages and weekend minutes. And then you got some phone like a Nokia or Ericsson device. But now when you decide on mobile phone service, you decide on the iPhone or the Android. The network is a secondary consideration. So there's been this really big value shift from network to the device. And that same transition happened in payments, where it went from merchant account provider to the software. And that's where Braintree's made efforts. So we provide credit card processing services to merchants. So when you click the buy button, we're the software behind the scenes that authorizes the credit card to banks and then pushes the money to the bank account. We make that happen. We take care of industry compliance and security. And our customers consist of many of the fastest growing and most reputable companies in, in the nation. So uh, Living Social, um, GitHub, Uber, Angry Birds, and on down the list. And uh, they love what we do. Um, they write us love letters because of what we build for them and how we work with them on the support side. Um, when I started Braintree, I had three goals. One, I wanted um, us to be considered the best payments provider in the industry as determined by our customers. And two, I wanted our employees to say that we are the best company they've ever worked for. And finally, three is I wanted to have a culture and environment that was so compelling that the most capable doers would find us irresistible. And I thought if we could tackle those three things, everything else would fall into place. And it has. And we've, we've, uh, I bootstrap the company, as Steve said, for four years. We do, we've doubled in size every month. We've been profitable for 53 out of our 55 months of existence. And uh, we have customers that love us. We have employees who love being there. And it's really, we're having a great time and we're trying to build something exceptional. And uh, it's been a, a great journey. So that is Terrific. These are three very interesting and successful companies. And now I want to talk about three things uh, for each of them. First, I want to talk about getting customers. And we heard a little bit about that, so I will start with that. Then talk about building the team. And then talk about your venture funding and where that came from and, and how you thought about that. So I guess, first of all, um, you have... You know, all three of you have these, uh, you know, great sets of customers. How did you get the first one? So, you know, when you were nothing. And Daraj, you, you talked about that with Microsoft. Um, how did that happen and what were the, the pushbacks? And then, you know, Brian, uh, the same thing. Um, 
So actually, um, for me, right, uh, it took me about 11 months to land the first customer. Uh, but in that month that I landed the first customer, we closed about three deals. So we closed Microsoft, uh, we closed uh, Allstate Insurance, um, and we closed CDW here in Chicago. Um, it was very interesting because uh, actually we were pitching uh, to uh, Allstate Insurance even before we were talking to Microsoft. It took a little bit longer. They're a little bit slower. And <laughs> well, I would imagine all these companies are slow. So how did you? Um, Microsoft was a little was bit fast. faster, a okay. little bit faster, I would say. But um, uh, I have an interesting story about uh, Allstate, uh, which uh, it's, it's quite a funny story. So this was in the, in the third month uh, after quitting Booz Allen Hamilton and uh, you know created a you know a, a sales pitch uh, thought of every objection that could, you people could have had answers for every objection and um, so this is B2B right so you need to have champions inside you need to know how to maneuver inside an organization um, you know th there are so many things that happen inside an organization that you're not privy to but uh, and you will be faced with that you'll have to handle. So I had a <clears throat> champion inside, and he was he was nice to me. Um, and um, um, uh, this guy, uh, uh, his name is Frank Palmer. Uh, he was a, he was somebody who was very different from most people. He was actually a power lifter. Uh, was four or five standard deviations away from normal, and uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, so I guess that's the only reason why Sounds he like was an excellent entrepreneur. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so be <Yeah>. careful. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, this, uh, he's he's a great friend. So uh, uh, he uh, so basically he was uh, he was kind enough to uh, listen to my crazy idea of how we would change the whole uh, you know uh, way of people making decisions and all of those things he was intrigued about that and and the one thing both of us shared was uh, our love for food so we would be having most of these crazy discussions in actually the big bowl uh, which is out in up in northbrook and uh, you know and i had uh, basically there was a day where i had to get my wisdom teeth removed and uh, uh, so i told my wife uh, that you know, uh, and and we ha I you know I was under her, her insurance, and the the dentist basically said, look, if you you have you should take one at a time, uh, because it it would cause a lot of pain. But then I have to you know pay the copay fee pretty much four times. So I said, why don't you take all all of them at the same time? <laughs> and <laughs> so basically, uh, you know, uh, that day, uh, so I had been uh, you know given all the medication and I told my wife that, look, if anybody calls, uh, don't pick up the phone, uh, you know, and, and don't tell me, except Frank Palmer. <laughs> and, you know, guess what uh, Frank Palmer calls that day and uh, he wants me to meet him for dinner. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so three years later, he tells me the story that he actually wanted to invite me for dinner uh, because he wanted to tell me that, you know, uh, he, this, he was not able to convince his people at Allstate Insurance. And I go with, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of sponge inside my uh, mouth and, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, swollen face and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going there uh, to have dinner with him and he feels really, really sorry for me. <laughs> so, so that's how he basically said, you know what, I can't say no to him, at least let him have a free pilot. So, so that was Allstate Insurance, but at the same time, Microsoft basically agreed, and we actually used the Microsoft uh, agreeing to k convince Allstate to do faster. So we did everything possible. Um, we got them to visit India. Uh, we, uh, you know, we basically I was pre pretty much a travel agent as far as Microsoft was concerned. Sh uh, you know, uh, shepherding them from city to city to make sure that they understood what was happening there. Uh, and then uh, convincing them that this is the right way to go about building uh, this new thing. So it was uh, quite a story, but uh, but I thought uh, the, the Allstate Wisdom Teeth story was interesting. The only bad part was for the next customer, I had lost all my Wisdom Teeth. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, so Brian, how, how did you get your first customer? 
Yeah, I learned a couple lessons uh, <laughs> in my first customer. Um, so first, I had just gotten off the streets of walking up and down uh, selling the stuff, and that's the last thing in the world I wanted to do. And so I started considering my options, and a friend of mine was doing, uh, it was, this is 2008, and he said, you know, like, social media is hot, like, dig and stumble upon or Reddit. And so if you can somehow link up with that and get some online coverage, then, you know, you could get people who come to your website. And he said, so what you've got to do is you've got to become a blogger, and you've got to write and become an expert in your industry. But the key is you have to be genuine. You can't plug your own stuff. You've got to be totally transparent because people will smell it. And so I started doing it. I started blogging about my industry. I started learning everything I could. I would link to my competitors. I would talk about everything, even things that would be detrimental to me. And um, I'd even write you know, provocative blog posts like uh, you know, Intuit at the time was being deceptive in what they were doing, and Costco was. And I'd call them out. I would you know, do screenshots and tell them how they were you know, duping customers. And then I would submit these uh, blog posts to the social media sites, and they would get shot up. I mean, I, my website was crashed like four times because the traffic was so heavy. And over time, people started linking back to the website, and they started seeing us as this, you know, a diamond in the rough in this industry. And we started getting inquiries. And uh, it was a great lesson that of, of transparency, expertise, and being genuine. Uh, it really works, and it's the proper way to communicate with people. And um, at the same time, I was also writing the website. Uh, so I wrote all the copy. All the, I've written the copy for the website like six times in the past five years. Um, and I was trying to be this big company. I was trying to hide behind our smallness. We had like two or three people. And so, you know, we were like this integrated provider of comprehensive payment processing services that, you know, a whole bunch of jargon. <laughs> and I read this blog post by another entrepreneur, and he said, be yourself and embrace it. If you're small, be small and love being small and play to your strengths. And it changed my outlook. And so I did play the small card. We were who we were. We were proud of who we were. And that combination of writing and then also communicating property uh, built an audience online that we never could have had. And we, we closed our first big customer, um, Open Table. Bless their hearts. They had 12,000 uh, restaurants around the world that they needed to um, figure out how to store credit card data and meet compliance standards. And they didn't want to build it in-house. They didn't have the tools. They wanted to outsource it. And we at the time had a couple developers on staff, and we said, sure, we can do it. Uh, of course. Right? Why couldn't we do it? And so we, did a one, we took a $1.3 million contract over three years, and it changed our world. We had a big name. We had revenue, um, and we had this momentum going. So uh, once we got over that hump, everything else started falling into place, but it was uh, really a good time to learn some really important lessons. And Scott, so you started, and your company was losing money, and so you had to figure out how to turn that around. So did you change anything, or what did you do to fix that? Gosh, I think we almost changed everything. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what, what was interesting, uh, back to the customer question that relates to, to where this answer will go, is um, dur I said I had this really short due diligence process that I, that I sort of for got forced on because the company was losing money and there's a new board came in. It was a group of angels and they were very worried about how much money was sort of burning through the company. So I thought, well, you know, like all good consultants do and all good GSB or Booth students do, I got to get some data on this. So I literally went out and stood next to zip cars and waited for people to sh come up to get the car. And I asked them why they were using the service. Um, you know, what's working? Um, and the company had been positioned as sort of very green and, and, um, and very um, sort of utilitarian. It was mostly silver and white Honda Civics uh, and Volkswagen Beetles. Um, so it was this really crunchy Cambridge, Massachusetts kind of positioning. And what I kept hearing from people was how much money they were saving because they didn't own a car anymore and all the stuff they got to do that they weren't able to do because they, they didn't own a car and they got to jump in these cars every once in a while and how it was sort of changing their life. And I kept hearing lifestyle and big cost savings that had nothing to do with being green or you know, doing something great for the city, which was an end result that came out of it. But that's not why the consumer was starting to join the service. So. The first thing we did was completely reposition the brand and make it more lifestyle oriented and we're still doing this today, make it aspirational, make it exciting, uh, make it sort of something like the future is now, like this is happening now, it's something that everyone when they heard it was going like, man, wish I would have thought of that, this is such a great idea. Um, and so we did this big change in brand positioning um, right off the bat. 
Um, the other thing that we did, and back to the customer acquisition, was it was costing almost $200 per customer to bring new members on board when I came into the company. Uh, and there was this big move afoot, literally as I was hired, to do a major consumer branding um, kind of push, in particularly in New York City, which is where you know most big marketing spends go to die, kill a company. I mean, it's just really hard to get above the noise in New York if you're a little startup. So I, I regretfully sort of let this happen, and just like I thought, it was a big media buy, bus shelters, public transit, radio ads, um, no television, thank God. But it was like a big swing of angel capital money, and it failed, um, like we thought it probably would. And there were 40 cars in all of New York City, um, and we took, but they were spread all over the place. So we took all 40 cars and put them around Chelsea, which is, if you know New York well enough, Chelsea's really a walkable neighborhood. It's, um, some would say it's almost bohemian. It's very young and hip and avant-garde and artists and um, people that will try new things like Zipcar. So we put almost all the cars in Chelsea and we put people out on the street, literally, with postcards about Zipcar. And um, we were doing crazy stuff. I hired a semi and put three zip cars on the back and stood on the back of it with a bullhorn. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I, mean, it was, this was I mean, it was fun, but it was crazy. And we're trying to raise awareness because what we realized, if you could get all these people to go to the website, if they can't walk to one of our cars in their neighborhood in less than 10 minutes, they're just not going to join because that was the value proposition. Wheels when you want them. It's, it's you know, convenience and access and freedom and simplicity is what we were trying to get across. So, and it started to work. Um, the growth rate in that Chelsea, in those Chelsea neighborhoods went from you know a few percent per month to like 15 percent a month, like it, practically overnight by concentrating the marketing and changing the brand positioning. So those were the really proving that we could, and we started acquiring customers for like 50 bucks, 40 bucks, 30 bucks per acquisition. If you just took all the marketing spend and divided that by how many customers came in, it went from like 200 bucks to under 50 bucks in a few oh. months. Uh, in those areas, in those geographies. So those were the first few things we did that really showed we could acquire customers at an economic um, value proposition that made a lot of sense for the company, and, and then we sort of built from there. Very interesting. Now, today, how do you uh, measure and monitor how you're doing? Do you guys have specific metrics or dashboards or whatever? Sure. Um, so as far as we are concerned, you know, we look at... So we initially thought of uh, the business in which we are, right? Um, it's uh, it's a um, it's a people business because uh, 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 because we work with Fortune 500 clients to a large extent, uh, and it's a combination of providing them a full ecosystem which consists of intellectual intellectual property, uh, technology, processes. And then, last but not the least, the people who have this interdisciplinary experience of math, business, and technology together. So, uh, you know, in the initial thoughts were of looking at it just like any other services consulting business, um, you know, customer satisfaction, repeat business, all of those kind of things. But at some point of time, you know, I said this, this just doesn't make sense. Uh, we wanted to, you know, look at ourselves and ask ourselves, how would, if, if we were our customers, how would we measure ourselves? And that actually brought uh, some level of honesty into the way we were thinking about our business. So we looked at it in three moments. And we call it, uh, and this is quite unconventional and very unique to Mu Sigma. Uh, the way we thought of it is, you know, moment of thought, uh, moment of action, and then moment of heart. Uh, moment of thought meaning does the customer f you know think that we have delivered uh, what we set out to do and does he feel that we can do more uh, moment of action meaning is the customer willing to act by giving us money and then is the customer willing to give us uh, act by recommending us to various people inside his organization. Um, then the third one is moment of heart. Uh, this to me came to me from interactions with my uh, today eight year old. At that point he was like uh, six, six years old. Uh, but uh, he's been a great teacher for me because he simplifies things. 
you know, if I have a problem and I talk to him, he simplifies it uh, very quickly. And I, you know, no business language needed because he simplifies stuff. So when I think of my eight-year-old, uh, I love doing stuff for him. Um, I, I enjoy it. Um, so that aspect of it was something that we wanted from our customers. They should enjoy doing stuff for us. We learned that these three moments, moment of thought, moment of action, moment of heart, are extreme, mutually exclusive in the way, you, they may have relations between each other, but they're the what you do to achieve each one of them is quite mutually exclusive. We also learned while we were executing on this, and I completely believe in uh, uh, what Brian was talking about in the transparency aspect of it, was that you have to operate with a very, very high level of transparency and you have to you have to understand that there is reciprocity in this. Unless you give moment of thought, you won't get moment of thought. Unless you give action, you won't get action. Unless you give heart, you won't get heart. So every month we have something called Mu 3D, which is what are the three things that we did right? What are the three things that we did we did wrong? And we very transparently we tell our customers that. When we do that, and we don't have any defense mechanism saying that we will mitigate this risk, or we will do this, or we will do, we just, we messed up here, you know, we effed up here, whatever you want to say it, you know. The, the simple, straightforward way of having that kind of interaction with our customers, that allowed us, you know, to on a, be on a constant way of, constant mode of improvement more than anything else. So that's how we measure ourselves. So. Brian and then Scott. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, we. When I started Braintree, I um, I paid attention to my bank account balance because we were boot, bootstrapped. But outside of that, <laughs> I didn't spend much time uh, going over analytics of the company. And um, I came back to our three goals: um, the best payment provider in the industry for our customers, Braintree saying it's the best place they've ever worked, and becoming an irresistible uh, draw for the most talented people. And so I spent all of my time recruiting and making sure our environment was pristine. On the recruiting front, um, like for example, when I was in charge of hiring, I would post uh, an ad to Craigslist and I would get inundated with 100 emails for any given position. And there was just no way I could go through that. I'd get, I would lose myself in the emails. And so what I started doing is I'd write in the post, please do not apply if, in big capital letters. And I'd list out the things, almost trying to offend people on who not to bring. And then I would get that really small group of people who would read the rest of the ad and I would say, please do apply if. And I would list the characteristics of people who would succeed. And they would jump out of their seats and say, that's the place I want to work. So I mean, for example, I built a company to 50 people with not a single manager. I would say you have two expectations here. One, uh, there's two things I'll measure you on. One is how awesome our customers say you are and how awesome your peers say you are. That's all I care about. And if that doesn't match up, we just don't have an internal infrastructure to support improvement. So we have to part ways. That's it. And we did that, and groups managed themselves throughout. And so we've been able to attract really talented people in the company in doing this. And we've also been able to maintain a really pristine environment. So like back to the transparency point, every other Friday we have town halls. And um, it's every one of the companies involved, and there is nothing off limits. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable it is. It doesn't matter how controversial it is. It doesn't matter if it's going to hurt my feelings. We bring it up because people have pebbles in their shoes, right? And if it doesn't get spoken about in a transparent, honest, honest manner, it will manifest itself in the hallway in hushed whispers, unquestionably. So to ma ma maintain a pristine environment of the highest capable doers, and then it just worked its magic. So for four years, we built this company without any marketing. It was entirely word of mouth. People love the way we built our products. They love the way we dealt with them, and it just grew on its own organically. And so I think there's, there's a recipe um, for, for growing companies, and that's not true for every, every company. It, it varies, but for us, it worked. And um, now that we're bigger, we're, we're measuring things um, you know, with, through analytics. We're seeing what it costs us to get a customer, but that's if maturity. But for the first couple of years, I, I would go back and do the same things again on measuring the company and focusing on those, those things. So we... You could imagine, you know, very asset-intensive business, uh, you know, not software margins for sure, um, at Zipcar. 
we we have we swim in data because we're a trans, we're transactional on one hand, but we're a membership driven model. So we sort of keep all the data from every transaction and every member interaction we've ever had. Um, and it's been complicated to sort of simplify. It's <laughs> <There is, laughs> a business development opportunity. You know, you know the. the the CEO's first job is sales, right? That, right there is an example of that. Um, the, <laughs> you're always selling. Um, so back to the data point, I think the, the, the thing that we swam in for a while was sort of how to, what are simple measures that really show us the business model and how it's performing, that show us how the customer feels about us, how that's performing, and then how employees feel about us and how that part of the business is performing. So let me just take you through the couple th or three things we do in each of those areas. On the business model part, there's two main things because we're a high fixed cost asset intensive business that can, that can make or break our business model. Uh, one is um, what we look at is revenue per car. Um, I mean, if you're, it's like a hotel, it's like an airplane seat. If you kind of get that revenue per car, revenue per room, revenue per mile or seat um, in the airplane business or the hotel business, that's the basic unit of measure. Uh, if we get that right, because we know how much it costs us to buy a car, we know how much it's worth when we sell it, and if we get the right revenue to run through the car, um, we know pretty much what the return on investment is of that asset base. Um, so we watch that very, very closely, and it's, it's trended up for years now, and it's continuing to trend up. Um, and so revenue per car for us has been, been very important. By the way, the, the, the unlevered return on investment in our vehicles, in our fleet, on an individual vehicle basis is about 38%. We're now using asset-backed securities. The levered return on that's at like 75 percent. So that ROI, I mean, that dog hunts. It's one of the reasons we were able to get when we get to venture capital. Being able to show that math to a venture capitalist sounded pretty interesting. So that's one key piece on the business model, um, and the other is revenue per member. Uh, we know about how much it costs to acquire a member now, and I said it's now under 50 dollars. Uh, as long as we know uh, roughly how much they spend sort of per month or per year and how long they stay with us, we can calculate pretty simply lifetime value of a membership. How much did it cost? What's the net margin over the life? And was that a, a, a viable business idea? Much like the vehicles. And we spend under 50. They spend four to 500 a year for five years. Uh, and we get a net margin of between 500 and $1,000, depending on which segment um, that they're, they're coming from. So again, like the vehicle economics, if you're got an ROI at 70 plus percent on levered vehicles and, you know, a, a five-year ROI of nearly $1,000 on our membership base, those metrics, as long as they continue, um, are very exciting to investors in Wall Street and continue to grow the company. So that's kind of how we look at the business model. Um, uh, and then the second piece was, um, was customer satisfaction. And we've re really boiled almost all of that down to net promoter score now. Um, for us, net promoter score is a, everybody know about net promoter score how likely are you on a scale of 1 to 10 to refer this business product or service to your friend or colleague? Uh, to the extent somebody scores you as a 9 or a 10, they're counted as a promoter. Uh, to the extent they score you a, a 7 or an 8, they're a passive promoter. And anything below 7 is a throwaway. They either hate you or they'll just never talk about you. Um, and so you've got to really focus on the 9s and 10s. And so we, we focus on more 9s and 10s. We try to get the passives, the 7s and 8s, up into 9 and 10. And we call everyone that gives us a six or lower. We, we literally call everybody that, that, that does that. I personally make phone calls every week of people that score us a six or below because I want to hear what we messed up. And it's, you know, those aren't the most fun, but uh, it's always a shocking moment when a customer hears from me and they say, you're, you're really the CEO of the company? You know, I'm doing this because I gave you a five on that survey? And, um, yeah, you know, I'm giving you a two next time. <laughs> But, you know, I can't, you can't imagine how instructive that is, but also what that does to the culture of a company when everybody's calling customers that, are on, that, are, that, are, that scored us. Now, our net promoter score is actually quite high, so thankfully I don't use my entire day calling the, the, um, the, the, uh, some of the low scores. So that's how we really focus. And, and, and then the customer side, uh, excuse me, on the employee side, uh, we've been working with Fred Reichelt, who's really the inventor of net promoter score. And um, Fred's been working on e-net promoter score, employee net promoter score. Can you ask employees that same question? You know, how likely are you to refer Zipcar as an employer on a scale of 1 to 10? And how many employees score us a 9 or a 10? And how many, you know, are passive and how many are detractors, um, below, 6 or below? Um, and we started that about, about a year ago. We did all sorts of employee engagement surveys and 9-box GE scorecards. And I, I, we never really... 
I mean, all that stuff is great and it's really helpful. It just didn't seem to work for us because we're this high growth entrepreneurial company, lots of millennials who, uh, for those of you in the room, I apologize, but like exhausting to employ these people. So, uh, <laughs> Jesus. I'm one of those guys. Yeah. Well, you're not a millennial that, that, I, that works at our company. I can just tell by listening to what you're saying. But um, the, the point is, you know, customer satisfaction is one thing. Employee satisfaction, if you blow it, really blows it for the customer. Happy employees often deliver the best service, or they will deliver the best service. And it's been proven now that ENPS, companies that are using this are Apple, Apple stores, uh, us, um, IKEA is now using it. So companies that use ENPS successfully and drive employee net promoter score up are now showing that profits go up, mm -hmm. customer satisfaction, the end customer satisfaction goes up as ENPS goes up. So that investment in driving ENPS um, is now, you know, sort of a booth way of thinking about it, but it's a way to measure um, how long-term shareholder value gets created because if you have ha happy employees, you're running an efficient business, and they're going to deliver great, um, great satisfaction to the customer. So um, those are the, the key ways. I mean, there's a thousand other things we look at, but um, if I could only see a scorecard once a month and I knew those things were okay, our business is probably going to be performing okay. Well, it's very interesting. So now you got your customers, you had your business going, and all three of you raised venture capital from very serious venture firms. So the next question is, when did you decide to do that? Why did you decide to do that? And uh, how did you decide to do that? And uh, we'll go Brian Scott Diraj this time. Now, I never wanted to raise money. I didn't want to lose control of the company. I didn't want someone else telling me what to do. It was my world to create. And we were fortunate because that was uh, in, in our power, because we were profitable, we were growing really well. Um, we, we encountered some problems, though, because in 2010 or uh, 11, we were doing three billion in volume, and which we were really excited about, but um, banks, of course, aren't that excited about risk. And so when I would tell them that I would pledge my car for risk <laughs> in case something went wrong, it just didn't go over very well. And so we hit this inception point in the company where we weren't this you know, cute small company anymore. We were doing really big volumes and they wanted to see a bigger balance sheet. And they wanted to see a third party in that had a lot of money. And it kind of forced our hands that we had to reconsider if we would raise money and, and it just raised all kinds of questions. What kind of company would we be? Um, how would that change our culture? Um, what, how would that change my life in dealing with these, with these investors? And we were in a, a fortunate situation because uh, for three years I had been emailed or, or called by an investor every day because we provided these services for technology companies. And when their investors would say who to use for payments, they'd say Braintree, and we love them. And so they all knew about us, and they knew a lot about us because their portfolios companies who they trusted would say such good things about us. And so when it came time to raise money, uh, we had – um, we had all the power um, to decide who we worked with and what terms we worked with them with, uh, work on. So I talked to you know the, the top venture firms in the nation, uh, almost all of them, and um, all of them expressed interest. And to me, it was really about a culture fit. Um, it was would they sync up with how we make decisions? Would they sync up with our long-term goals? And would I retain complete control over the company? And I got all those things, and I found that partner in Excel. And to this day, I think it's one of the best decisions we've made. Uh, they've been a fantastic partner. Uh, they just are good with entrepreneurs. They also have a really high cost of bad behavior because the entrepreneurial world is so small. If, if they don't behave well, entrepreneurs find out fast, and they, of course, lose their flow. But they've been exceptional, and we've enjoyed working with them. And uh, what has been most surprising to me about raising money is we were a four-year-old four -year company when we took that money, and we were a nobody. No one knew about us except for our insular world of tech companies and, and investors. Once we took that money, we became a somebody. That third-party validation all of a sudden made us interesting and, and worthy of press coverage. So we didn't get a single um, – we were not covered one time in the press for four years. And since uh, – so I guess it's been 10 months now, we've been covered 35 times. And I've won awards personally for entrepreneurship. And so it's just been this amazing experience where I didn't ever think the third party validation would be that significant, but it has been. And uh, I thought we could prove ourselves based upon merits, customer base, and what they'd say about us. But 
uh, is a good lesson of the value of that. And um, we're in a better state than we've ever been before. And I think people at Brainshare would say that. I think our customers would say that. And um, I'm pleased that we did take this route. Scott? Going to go in order. Okay. Um, so I came into a company that was, as I mentioned, was troubled. Um, we used venture. Uh, we used venture later, but we used angel uh, funding. We raised a total of ten million dollars of angel funding wow. um, over the first two years or so I was on the job, um, and uh, that was a thrilling ride. We won't get into too much of that, but I was <laughs> able to get people like Tom Stenberg, who was the founder and then was the CEO at Staples, a local Boston guy other people involved in the business that actually helped us ultimately, I think, when we got to venture capital. Um, the, the, the reason we decided to go to the VC community was, um, I remember specifically the day this happened. It was in July of, of, um, of 2004. Um, we had a young controller at the time, and uh, we, were, we were really working on making the business model uh, profitable in two or three cities, Boston, New York, and DC were the only three cities we were in. Uh, we had, you know, kind of 100 to 150 cars in each city and very low GNA, very low overhead, and trying to make sure we could become profitable at the city level. Because the theory of the case was if you could prove profitability at the city level, then you could probably get more money and build more cities because people now understood, you know, how long it took and how much capital it took to make a city profitable um, and, and grow it to profitability. So, and I remember in July of 2004, a controller brought in um, the P&L, probably early August, and, you know, there it was, July, and I looked across the three columns, you know, Boston, profitable, <laughs> uh, D.C., profitable, New York, profitable, first time ever. And I just remember at that moment thinking, wow, you know, this is, this is like a moment in the history of this company that we've now got, it was not a lucky shot that you did this in one city, uh, and then we did it the next month and the next month again. So, you know, to be able to do that. So we went out to the, the, the capital markets, and uh, it's, it's pretty similar to, to, I think, the theme you're going to hear, I'm guessing, from all from most people who, who feel like they successfully raised venture capital. Um, we decided to go out to the market uh, and raise $10 million bucks in our first venture round. And I kind of drew up my list of, of five or six VCs that would be sort of ideal, because we're a pretty unique company. We weren't too tech. We're you know, really a first mover brand, proprietary understanding of a business model first to scale, those were the arguments we were making. So it wasn't like this was this really protectable intellectual property or, you know, where, where most VCs were. So, um, I, you know, I tried a couple of VCs in Boston where Boston tends to be more, you know, widgets and, and software back at least in those days. It wasn't a business model, brand comfortable kind of venture community in Boston. And um, I, got a I got a voicemail on my, my office phone one day uh, from a guy who, who said, you know, hey, I just read got off a plane. I read a story about you. We had a nice write-up in, in, um, in Fast Company magazine, and I was named as one of four leaders you, get, you need to know. And um, it told the story of how I came into the company and what we had done in this first few months of profitability. And he had read the story, and he said, it's Bob Cagle at Benchmark. And, you know, Bob Cagle was like the top guy on the West Coast that I would have wanted to call, and, and, and I'm you know, it was agonizing for weeks. How, we're not doing very well with the VC community in Boston. How do I get to a guy, you know, like Bob Cagle? Would he even take my call? <laughs> so, and I, I, I thought, it, I really did think at that moment it was one of my friends yanking my chain because I had talked about trying to, you know, but it, it, so, you know, I called, of course, I call right back and, and, and Bob, you know, who was the first investor in eBay, by the way, he hired Meg Whitman from uh, out of her job to come to eBay. So, um, you know, why Bob still works this hard isn't clear to me, but he's flying around in a private jet finding new companies now. But, um, you know, we talked on the, I called him and he, it was really Bob Cagle that left the message and <laughs> we talked for a few minutes and he flew out the next week and, and we literally penciled in a term sheet in about 30 minutes across the table. Uh, and the story that, that really makes it, I think, exciting for us is Bob is from Detroit and he went to Stanford Business School and then got into venture capital in, in Palo Alto and eventually became one of the founding partners of Benchmark, huge success story at eBay and a bunch of other companies, Open Table um, and, and other companies out there. And he had never been able to find a company in the auto industry. Uh, and his, his, his mother and his grandmother had worked at like the Buick plant in Flint, Michigan. And he always wanted to find something that was in the, around the auto industry. And he was willing to kind of go take the leap of faith that this was not a typical venture capital firm or venture capital investment, but he liked the team, he loved the story, and we were starting to become profitable at the city level. 
and um, and his you know passion for doing something in the auto industry in a way that was game changing was the reason we ended up doing the deal, and it it allowed us in like 30 minutes to iron out a, a term sheet. Uh, and the, the, the end of that particular episode is probably also interesting to finish the story. We get the term sheet on the table. We're starting to paper the, the series um, of, of funding. And I get another cold call. This time it's Steve Case. The Steve Case from America Online. This is a true story. Um, so Steve had left America Online. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a tough fall coming out of AOL. And he founded a new firm, uh, which is called Revolution today. Um, he and a few other folks, Ted Leonsis, um, a few other people that were out of uh, American Express and, and AOL. And he said, you know, I'm down here. We just got this new office in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. And I keep seeing these zip cars around. And, you know, here's, um, here's this new, new fund we're going to form. And, you know, it's mostly my capital. I want to invest in companies. And, you know, we're pretty interested in putting some money into Zipcar. We really like what you're doing. We want to be in game changers that build great brands and have a big impact. And I um, said, so, well, that's like our company, so that seems like a pretty good fit. So I got Bob Cagle with a term sheet, and Steve Case cold called me. Both of them had cold called me. And it was, you know, I think it's, it's a testament to getting yourself into a lucky position. I mean, luck is an element of almost all of these stories. Uh, but, you know, you make your luck sometimes, and I think there's reasons for both of those things happening. Um, you know, the Fast Company story, which we went and got. Um, and, and, and Steve seeing our cars was kind of lucky, but... Um, end of the story is Steve wanted a controlling stake in the company. In those days, he thought he should have control of companies he invested in. Felt way too early for us to, to give up a controlling stake in the company um, back in, in the middle of 2005. So we ended up doing the benchmark deal. Steve bought the only other company in the space, which is called, was called Flexcar, more of a West Coast company. Um, and Steve and I, through that phone call, got to know each other. And uh, two years, about three years later, two, late 2007, we ended up merging the two companies. We were about, about um, they were about a quarter of our size. They were struggling still. Steve had put a bunch of money in it. Um, and so we got to know each other. So Steve's on our board now. He's our single largest shareholder. Um, we merged the two companies. So, uh, you know, really interesting starting point of how we, mm. uh, of how we raised, um, raised money. In, in the, and by saying no, we ended up sort of preserving the option. And he went off and bought something else that we merged later. So it was a pretty cool starting point. So, uh, my case uh, was a combination um, of uh, de-risking uh, and also uh, getting validation. So, we were doing very, very well. We were profitable from, from the beginning uh, and we were growing really, really fast. Um, the, uh, uh, but I had started the company as a 28, 29 year old uh, with pretty much no Rolodex. Uh, and I had uh, invested all of my savings. I'd come here from India, from a lower middle class family, and taken, you know, I, I, I was a very stingy person, so I would save a lot of money uh, as a, a consultant at Booz Allen and Pricewaterhouse. So took saved a lot of that money, put everything, um, sold my home, put everything into Mu Sigma. So we had invested about $450,000 of my own money into Mu Sigma and didn't take a salary for three and a half years. So, uh, you know, um, my wife uh, was working at Motorola. She's the smarter person at home. Uh, so we, uh, you know, we actually shared the same rank in our electrical engineering class. She from the top and me from the bottom. But, uh, <laughs> no, <it's very> true. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, but, but we had this, uh, uh, you know, 2008, you know, 2008 was coming up. We were growing. All of these things were happening. At that point, the the thought process we had an offer to get bought out uh, for about a little bit more than 240 million dollars. I owned more than 70 percent of the company at that time, and uh, we should have put a serious amount of money uh, into uh, into my bank balance. Uh, and the first day the offer came from this very big company. I won't name them. Uh, uh, super excited about it. Um, you know, uh, both Ambika and I, uh, you know, wanted to celebrate. Uh, that evening, um, as we were thinking about this, talking about what we would do with the money, all of those things, you know, didn't uh, feel correct. Uh, next day morning, uh, we kept, you know, she, she basically came back to me and said, you know, you don't feel good. I, I don't know why, but I don't feel good about this. Uh, the biggest reason is that I'm most loyal to the idea. 
Um, and then, you know, I'm loyal to customers and, uh, you know, employees. And then last, I'm loyal to uh, uh, the uh, investors and all of those other people. Investors meaning I, in this case I was, you know, but I thought in this case, if this company were to acquire us, um, the idea would get killed. They would not know how to build this company which, which is about creation of a latent demand uh, and fulfilling a latent demand. And Ambika basically put it very well to me. She said, when you do this, you know, when you wanted to build this company, it was it was a common noun, just a company. Today, it's a proper noun. You have all these offers from these great companies. But what you want to do is make this a verb. Uh, and that's going to take a long time. Are you up for it? And if you're up for it, then you got to go stick it out and, um, you know, feel okay about not making as much money in the later half, just like you felt okay uh, about not having a salary for three years. So, uh, so at that point, we said, okay, so we have to de-risk ourselves a little bit. Uh, so we took money, um, to, uh, took a little, you know, took about 25, 30 million dollars off the table. And, uh, you know, th that way, the next time this kind of thing happens, money was out of the equation. And we were building it for the long term. So that was very, very important for me. Uh, the second part of it was the validation aspect of it. We uh, and the c connection to various places because the Rolodex was not there. So we got ourselves the people who we got ourselves were from the East Coast and the West Coast. General Atlantic Partners, which basically had money from all, all the you know pretty much 34 families of for 34 of the wealthiest families in the world. That's their money that they manage. And so the so serious connections, you want to talk to prime ministers, they'll somehow figure out how to make that happen. And then, uh, um, uh, and then uh, Axel and Sequoia Capital, which had the connections to all the West Coast companies, which we needed access to because we were in the business of uh, you know, using data and helping people make better decisions, which needed us to have that connection to that ecosystem. And the third part was, we got uh, funding from you know FTV Capital, which uh, basically uh, the top uh, 25 financial institutions in the world put money into uh, into this fund, and they invest into technologies that may be useful for financial services. So all of these m w could actually have access to customers for us. So that was the thought process. Uh, my lesson from that was that don't believe in your investors that they will bring customers. You got to <laughs> make your own customers. They will say that they will, but you got to build your own customers. But <laughs> so. very, very interesting. So you still have to work. Yeah. Um, so last question, and then uh, we will take some questions from the audience. Um, how'd you build your teams? You know, the key hires uh, at the start, how'd you get them to come along, and uh, have you kept them? I, I can go first? Yeah. So, uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, in my case, I think, uh, you know, we went through about 65, 70 people before one of them accepted. Uh, so it was not my choice, it was their choice. Um, so I just wouldn't wanted somebody to work uh, uh, work with me uh, more than anything else uh, because the initial years it was an idea it was uh, it was new uh, and we needed guys who would believe in this uh, but my bottom line lesson is that both heart and mind uh, are extremely important uh, and the initial years you are looking for people who can deal with a tremendous amount of ambiguity. Um, you know, uh, and they would be willing to thrive in chaos uh, and still, uh, uh, you know, put their heads down and, and do what it takes. Um, it's, 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 it's people who will watch for your back uh, because uh, it gets really, really rough. Uh, and uh, so those are the people, I mean, people who you would want to be with. Uh, and uh, um, so that that happens to be something that you know uh, you, you, that was how I found my initial teams. But there there is also a duality in this because of the fact that as companies grow, not all people will scale with the company, and it's it's uh, it's, it's actually a very sad but true story that everybody will evolve very differently, and you still will have to stay more honest to the idea than to your loyalties towards any one person, which obviously is there as human beings. Uh, but that is; those are actually hard decisions that one has to take, 
uh, and and that's when you look outside and make sure that you continuously keep attracting new talent because uh, the only thing that is constant in whatever we do is change um, so we have to constantly keep evolving so so that those were all the some philosophies that i live by as i think about teams uh, and last but not the least we put a serious amount of personal equity uh, the the company's equity in employees hands mm -hmm. uh, and uh, made sure um, that they they had a f good opportunity to create wealth so I yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so i mean i this is my ninth year as the CEO of the company. Uh, I'm now the longest tenured employee of the company, so um, I have definitely rebuilt the team. Um, actually, almost a couple times now as we've as we've grown. Um, I think the common theme that I would just uh, would 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 probably mirror is is um, the the key ingredient. And now that we're doing this ENPS employee NPS thing that I talked about, the key ingredient in success um, for our most successful, most satisfied employees is passion. Do they really love what we're doing? Do they really love what they're doing within our company? Um, and so we've started to really un try to do a better job of understanding how well are they aligned with the core values. We have five very simple core values. If you go to our website, you can read them. And we take that really seriously. It's not something that's like at the water cooler. That, um, and we have a mission statement uh, to enable simple and responsible urban living. We have a vision statement that says, we believe there will be more car sharers than car owners in major cities around the world. I mean, this is like big, bold stuff. If you're not into that, if you don't really feel a personal connection to either building a brand around that or the operational complexity of delivering on that model or aligning with those core values, one of which is keep it simple. You know, if you like to really build complicated stuff and hang everything on your technology that you can put on it, you probably wouldn't fit in as an engineer at Zipcar because we, we, we make more hard choices to not do stuff in our technology than stuff we add in all the time. So I think cultural fit core values and fit, and really big, you know, really profound passion for what we're doing as a company. The fact that we have a game-changing innovation and business model and innovative technology that we're, we're delivering. If you find a connection to that, um, and you're willing to, to grow with the company. Um, I talked about innovating yourself as one of the most important innovations of all. That's been my own personal learning. I've tried to take that out to the employees in the company. Um, you have to have great resilience when you fail. You have to be able to learn from failures. You have to listen and watch how people are reacting to stuff you say and things you do and be willing to change. Because like I said earlier, I think at the start, um, you know, we've grown 7,000% or something like that, like an order of magnitude in revenue uh, plus. Um, and, and we're still going nicely above 20% growth right now. Um, you can't grow five or 10% a year personally and just keep up in that environment. And you know, I keep trying to explain that to our employees all the time that um, if you align with core values and you're into this concept of personal innovation that every once in a while you'll find a personal breakthrough about how to lead or how to communicate, how to use your time, what you're going to focus your efforts on, what part of the company that you want to be, be in, um, engaged in, um, you're going to be very happy and very successful and have a lot of passion about what you do. And that, that's been a real key um, for us over time. We've gotten much better at scoring the likelihood of that employee by measuring and watching um, those dimensions. Yeah, I'd say um, young companies like Braintree live and die by our first 15, 20, 25, 30 people. And um, that number could be a lot smaller uh, in the beginning. And it is the most important thing a uh, business can do is get the right people initially to set the stage. And um, I went, I spent a tremendous amount of time and effort trying to recruit the best people. And I wanted to lay out a vision, uh, a purpose for what we were doing. And so I wrote down, um, if you go to our About Us page, braintreepayments.com about, you can read about uh, how we define culture. A culture is the summation of all inputs. It's your beliefs, your principles, your practices, your policies, your jokes, your everything, everything is creates culture and it always forms it's just a question of you'll have a hand in or not it will it will um it will be there so uh, we went to extensive lengths to try to define what culture is what powers culture what causes culture and then march it over time and i think that's one of our has been the reason why we've succeeded is that we have this environment that really capable people love um, they want 
to be free of politics and of drama. They want to be able to exercise their creativity and imagination and, and skills. And if you give that environment, um, you can sell this vision of what you want to do. We wanted to build an exceptional company. We didn't want to just make money. We didn't want to just do something frivolous, right? We wanted to build an exceptional company. We wanted to attract people who were interested in doing that. And um, we've never had a person leave Braintree, um, which is a remarkable achievement. I'm sure in, in uh, years to come, we'll lose people. As you were saying, that it's just really hard as a company grows, you change. And not everyone evolves the same. And it's heartbreaking because these people have given so much. And I want every single person at Braintree to go you know, for the long haul. But that's just, uh, just not the case. It's not going to be practical. But um, we have to do our best to make sure the very best people are always there. Because if we have overgrowth and weeds and we don't curate our environment, then you'll lose that, that, um, that culture and the, the best people will leave. And so it really is the heart and soul, I think, of, of what we are and what we, uh, who we are and what we do. Very good. So now I have, we have some time for questions. And uh, Michael. I'll go first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> habit. <laughs> so uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the you know the they didn't miss the opportunity. They spotted the opportunity. They very well spotted the opportunity, and they spotted the opportunity even before us. The reason, my in my perspective, that they were not able to uh, execute on the opportunity was the operating model that they chose and the view of the world that they uh, the view of the world that they had see the view of the world that they had as far as analytics and decision sciences were concerned was that this is an occult science this is value added services this is about what we are doing this is you know we are doing what we are doing is it services or you know something else business process outsourcing this is about that so they looked at this as a niche business we looked at this differently. We looked at this as a nascent business. The difference between niche and nascent is that niche, you know, will remain special. Nascent is young and will grow and become mainstream. So that perspective made us think of this business that is a business which has art and scale, science, but it has to scale. It has to become industrialized. What that meant was that you'll have to take this occult science and demystify and democratize it. So the way you started looking at the business was that I'm not going to hire these special kind of people who will come and do this new thing. I'm going to start because that talent is not even there anywhere in the world in the scale that you need. You'll have to look for people and say that, okay, with this raw material, what can you do? What is the best training programs? What is the best processes? What is the best technology that you can t take so that you can take many Clark Kents and make them fly like Superman? <laughs> so that's the thought process with which we... So the view of the world that's itself terrific. was very different. So, so that's... I, mean, I think in our case, um, you know, whether it was the auto manufacturers or the, the car rental companies, um, they're, they're, I'd say they've gone through two or three phases. Um, the first was sort of denial and mockery, um, where they, we were a bunch of tree huggers in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, we were just going to change the world, but we'd never make any money. Um, and I mean, the, the CEOs literally were saying this stuff to the press, and um, I, I was like, "That's great." You know, that means they're just not even going to focus on this for a while. Um, you know, they just they mock what they didn't understand. They went through that phase for for a while, um, and then. Um, and then I think when we started to get some, some traction and some progress, they tried to enter the business um, three or four years ago, but they did it again through this like worldview lens that is completely different than the way we think about it, right? If you're a car rental company, it's a transactional business, right? They fight it out on Orbitz and Expedia for the, tra the, the traveler, the leisure traveler. There's Salesforce going into IBM or Hewlett Packard or major companies trying to get the on-airport business traveler, the most profitable segment. Um, you know, or if you're enterprise, you're trying to do deals with Allstate and State Farm for vehicle replacement when you crash your car and it's at a body shop and they give you that replacement vehicle. I mean, those are like major sectors. 
none of them were about replacing car ownership, really, truly replacing car ownership. So we always had this perspective that our goal is to sell car ownership one hour at a time. And so we want a great auto insurance policy. We want the gas to be paid for and the pricing. We want to have cars out there that you would aspire to drive if you were going to own a car, Mini Coopers, Priuses, BMW 3 Series, not, you know, white Chevy Malibus. No no offense to anybody from GM, but <laughs> I mean, these were just not very exciting cars you got stuck in, right, with one hubcap, hubcap missing. So, you know, this was sort of an aspirational approach. And the further along we got, the more they tried to be transactional rental car companies by the hour. And it was... It was fun but painful to watch. And, you know, I've since gotten to be able to talk to people like Jeff Bezos or, you know, other, other CEOs who, who, you know, faced the same stuff. You know, like when Barnes & Noble was threatening, oh, we're going to come in and just crush um, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon at one point. And, you know, Blockbuster was going to come in and crush Netflix at one point. Well, they just never did because the cultures, the, view, the world view, um, the singular focus of startup companies is – is a profound advantage, right? It's just all we do, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're building a company and a culture and a value proposition and delivering a service that really does one very simple thing. It replaces car ownership. And, and if, you, if you're on airports and you're trying to do that business and you're over here trying to replace cars and body shops, this looks like you know, a sideshow, and it still is. And, it, uh, and then it starts to cannibalize their core business when they did have a little bit of success so they changed the reporting into the global sales guy who is now trying to kill it, I think. So, you know, but this is, we're not the first time this has happened where a new category starts to emerge and you just got to, like, hit the gas, though. I mean, you have to have the confidence as the leader and the entrepreneur that you and your team can execute against these big companies. And, and you know, no bluster, no BS, just do it. You know, execute. and Because um, they're about bluster and they'll throw the stuff against the wall and see if it sticks. And we just kept executing all the way through it. And, um, and we've had offers to buy the company from these guys now. And we kept saying, no, I couldn't imagine being in that culture personally. So, you know, if we ever did sell the company, I'm, you know, I'll be here helping Steve or something else. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not going to say Okay, no sell to the you. company now. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it just, it, but they're just very different kind of organizations. They do wonderful things, but they don't do what we do very well. See, there, was, there was a conversation I had with uh, Mike Moritz from Sequoia uh, about this same topic. And one of the things that he pointed out was that, you know, in most of the businesses that they have looked at, the people who changed the business actually most often came from outside the business. Right. Uh, and so, you know, because of this worldview mentality, uh, you know, the, and it, it's once you have the worldview mentality, it's very difficult to build a business with a different view. And in businesses to succeed today, Every aspect of this business has to impute towards that, to has to be in sync with a view, right? If you're out of sync with that view, if your walls say something else, and your people say something else, and you say something else to your customers, and you do something else after saying something else, it's not going to go well. Uh, so it's the worldview becomes very, very important in how you, you know, you, you approach the business overall. Sorry. Yeah, in, in our world, um Credit card payments was commoditized, hyper-competitive, and solved. Everyone just, I r just wrote it off. And um, why would you want to get into a low-margin, commoditized, hyper-competitive business? <laughs> and we did. <laughs> um, we saw two things. One is that there was a real opportunity to clean things up. It was just a neglected industry. And two, there was this massive shift on the horizon of the value from the merchant account provider to the software and the platform on top of the software. And we're just beginning to see that where today, your credit card processing is a dumb exchange between money, right? Um, now with emerging technologies like geolocation, loyalty, rewards, social, mobile, personalization, all that's being uh, layered on top, in and around, on top of payments. And so we're, right at, we're at the right time um, with the right products to take that revolution. So we just found an industry that was uh, everyone else had written off so I'm going to ask, we have a, just a couple more minutes. I have one question I want to ask, and then I'm going to finish. So two of these companies are in Chicago, one's in Boston, and uh, your venture funders are Silicon Valley to a large extent. So 
the question is, can you succeed outside of the Bay Area or even outside of New York, which are two of the hot spots? You know, how have you guys succeeded in Chicago and Boston? And has that been uh, a plus or a minus or neither? Uh, in my mind, I thought, uh, you know, I think uh, being in Chicago has, uh, as an entrepreneur, right, it, it gave me uh, one perspective was that it, access to capital and all of those things was not, you know, and it was, uh, entrepreneurship doesn't, is not as viral in Chicago as in San Francisco or uh, Bay Area or all of these places. But that also makes entrepreneurship a little bit pure. Uh, anybody who goes into a Starbucks Rest, uh, you know, coffee shop in in Silicon Valley says that I'm going to start a company right now. Uh, in Chicago, you really have to, uh, you know, really really believe in things. So most of the companies, most of the initial clients that we built were all in the 294 belt, uh, you know, driving up and down. So that was one element of it. The second aspect of it was, you know, we truly were global uh, from day one. Uh, you know, Bangalore and India was integral to how we built the company. So you know, we were geography agnostic from that perspective, uh, you know, and that was one of the reasons why we took uh, money from outside Chicago to a large extent because then we had those connections outside Chicago. Uh, the last but not the least, as far as the my business, uh, you know, I have uh, the, the brand, the Chicago, University of Chicago brand has been so integral to my business mm. uh, because every time I introduce myself, I actually tell them and tell that my initial employees were all from University of Chicago because what we do uh, fundamentally is based on you know a data driven approach to decisions and all of those things which uh, you know which Chicago is known for uh, and uh, so all of those things actually made a big difference for us I think in our case um in Boston, you know, Boston's gone through a couple of cycles of innovation in terms of having a big ecosystem for innovation for a while, and then it kind of, it sort of dropped down. I think it's on its way back up again now. Um, but I, I think the capital will flow wherever you want to be. I mean, I, I don't think the capital part is a big issue. It's probably a little easier if you're sitting up in Northern California because you're just going to get access to people that are, that are, that are into this. But they realize, you know, Austin, Texas now is kind of a hotbed of, of startups. So. Um, you know, with, with no offense to my friends from Texas, if you can do it in Austin, you can probably build it. I mean, it wasn't much of, a, <laughs> of, of an entrepreneurial place, but UT and, and Dell and, and some of the ecosystem that developed um, in Austin, same thing that happened in, um, in, in, that happened in Boston when, back when DEC was very big, digital equipment, um, and started to spawn companies out of DEC. Now EMC is a big employer. So I think what helps is if there are big employers where there's potential entrepreneurs or employees coming out that you can hire from. It's really not about the financial capital. For us, it's about the human capital. Can we, can we attract and bring people into the geography that we want to operate in? And um, we've not had as much trouble uh, in Boston um, as, as some companies have had, because I think we're, we're sort of an exciting new model. But it's all, to me, it's all about the retaining and getting the human capital. I do think the, the financial capital will come to wherever you want to put your company. I was I was with the mayor and the governor last week, and my phone turned on uh, a book on tape. <laughs> I like this, uh, so I empathize with the situation. Um, <laughs> um, so I don't know if you all understand the context, maybe behind Steve's question, but in the tech world, uh, de these debates about you know is it better to build a, uh, a tech company on the West Coast, the East Coast, the Midwest, it really gets people fired up. And it's a debate that's been raging for a long time. And so we wanted to add some fuel to the fire. We recently uh, started the dodgeball tournament here in Chicago. And we thought, what better way than to get a bunch of you know, tech companies together and hurl objects at each other. And it's been remarkably successful. Our, we had our third one you know, last month. We had 16 teams. Um, Groupon flaunted around the, the trophy that they'd won the previous game. And they got knocked out in the first round. Um, but we're now looking to launch a national dodgeball tournament. We're, we're exploring this. And so we'd have West Coast, East Coast, you know, Boston, New York, San Francisco, and Chicago. And then we'd have a, a championship here in Chicago. And that would prove, right, <laughs> where you should build a tech company. Uh, we'll see if we can pull it off, but we're, we're messing with the idea. Um, I would say we have loved Chicago. 
uh, we found fantastic people here that are loyal, that are hardworking, and that really care about the company. Um, we're also opening an office in California. We are trying to diversify the places we're trying to find talent. In Chicago, for example, there's just no payments experience. Um, PayPal's not here. Google isn't here. So you just have a very, um, in some areas of our company hiring, we just don't have a big talent pool. So um, we've made do. We, uh, I think we had like 41 people at the company until we had our first hire who had payments experience. So it proves that you know, it can be helpful to build a company without anyone having previous experience. Uh, but also, it'd be nice to know things that took us six months to learn, you know, we learn in, you know, a week. Um, but I would say that it, it's a fun debate. Uh, there's good points on both sides, but uh, I think that companies prove all the time that you can build a successful company wherever you're at. Well, on that note, uh, we are at 4 o'clock, and uh, I first want to say this has been an unbelievable panel. This is perhaps the best panel I have ever moderated, uh, and uh, the stories were great. Uh, three unbelievable entrepreneurs. Uh, I learned a ton, and uh, I want to thank you all and wish you all the most best, most awesome success. So,